How's everybody doing tonight? Doing good? Thank you for braving the elements of sprinkles on your windshield. Uh, for everyone watching online, don't mind us. We're just blessed with amazing weather. So when the first little moisture hits everyone's windshield, we freak out. So we're so glad that you're with us as well. Um, I'm really thrilled to be able to bring the Word of God uh, to you tonight. Uh, before we do, just a couple quick announcements. Just to piggyback on those uh, video announcements, uh, some of you might have been able to uh, get a ticket um, like this for the Wiz. This is really just a promotional item. There's more at the Welcome Center. We just encourage you from the bottom of our hearts, take advantage of this unique opportunity. This is really new for us. Uh, it's going to be a full-length production, like when you would go see a play at Broadway or whatnot, you know, two hours with an intermission in the middle. It's, it's full on. So we want to be able to reach out to our community and for some people who would never darken the door of a church and really does give them something that we feel that they could enjoy, but also, at the end, give them a bite-sized nugget of the gospel so that they're able to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. So I just encourage you, grab one of these, prayerfully consider people in your world who you can invite. And just one last thing, uh, the video announcements mentioned, uh, the Christmas serve day, there's a tent out on the plaza. Tonight is the last night that you're able to financially donate towards families who uh, don't have enough for a Christmas meal or don't have enough to be able to give their kids toys. And you could do that in person tonight and the last night for that. However, after tonight, you can still do it online. Just go to cottonwood.org, go, go to the outreach page, and you can still find a way to donate there. Is that cool? Cool, awesome. Hey, if you have your electronic device or Bibles, you can already go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, what we're going to do in the month of December is we don't have a theme for this one. It's open theme. I was told... Go ahead and bring what you feel God wants to speak to his people. Uh, just because of just the different type of uh, breakup we have with the production going on and whatnot. Last month was healing. This one is kind of a wild card, if you will. So I'm really, really excited. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm eager to hear what God has to say to us and especially to me. So let's go ahead and join our hearts together and ask him to do just that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight, God. Thank you so much for your presence already being here. And even through worship, you starting to whisper to our heart who you are and who we are in you. And so tonight I ask you to challenge us, not to make us feel bad, but to challenge us in the way that a parent would a child. Challenge us out of love so that we could better and more accurately see who you are and who we are in you. So that things that have kept us back, hung us up, been nipping at our heels for far too long that we could finally be rid of them, gain freedom in that, and in that you would get all the glory. We ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, it is Christmas season, and uh, how many of you guys have already done your Christmas shopping? How many of you have some of these sitting underneath your Christmas tree? Yeah, me neither. Um, I still got a lot to do. There's a lot that's still has yet to be wrapped, but there is one phenomenon that maybe you have experienced that I have, and that is the older I get, the less there are of these underneath the Christmas tree for me. Is there anyone out there that could identify with that? I mean, I was thinking about this the other day, and when I was a kid, there used to be an unnumerable amount of Christmas presents underneath the tree that said, to Robert. And I would go and I would count them. I would gather them all up into some big tower. I'd get inside the middle. I'd be like bathing in it like Scrooge McDuck in all of his gold. Just so happy in how many gifts I had. And then you get older and you become an adult. And all of a sudden you get swooped on you something called Secret Santa. When really it's just code for, hey, we don't got money for all the adults. So you're responsible for one family member. <laughs> and then you have like two or three presents. And you're like, oh, man. And then you take it upon yourself to like, wait a minute, I, 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 I can take this under control. How many of you guys have ever treated yourself to your own presence? <laughs> come on, come on. You know, to Robert, from Robert. You know, you kind of have in your heart exactly what you want, kind of dream it up. Ooh, I got it. You kind of get that money that you don't have, if you know what I'm saying. And you go out and you get the present you want, you wrap it up, you're so stoked, because you know that I am going to get something that I really really want. What I want to do is take it another level. Awesome glitter. What if you not just got your own gift, but what if you made your own gift for yourself? 
And for many of us, maybe many of us aren't crafty or handy, maybe some of you are. But what I want us to do is just for a moment imagine. Imagine that you are the world's renowned painter. You are the most famous painter alive and everyone seeks out your work. Smallest pieces of your work go for millions. It's in galleries everywhere around the world. And yet, in your work, you come to the season of life where you want something to not speak to people, but to speak to yourself. Something to influence you, to inspire you, to daily speak to you. And so you think of this grand idea. What would be my life's grand work? My work of creation. And so you spend time thinking about it. You're eating lunch, you're thinking about it. Going to bed, you're thinking about it. You're designing it in your mind, piece by piece, mulling it over it, month after month, until you feel you have fully designed the blueprint of what you want this work to look like. And then you commission the work. You go out and you get the art supplies, and you get everything that you need, and you begin to work feverishly. And this isn't just some small feat. This takes months. Years go by. People are wondering, how come he hasn't come out with a new work? You're dedicated, you have been working on this for years, and finally you are finished. And this work isn't gonna go to the highest bidder for hundreds of millions of dollars. It isn't gonna go to the most famous museum in all the world to hang there for the world to see, no, no, no. You've already picked out a place in your private home for you to look at it, to observe it, to be blessed by it, so that every morning, the first thing you see, and every evening, the last thing you see and the last thing you think about would be this work of art so that for the rest of your life you would be blessed by this. I'm here to petition to you that you are God's artistry. You are his finest work of art. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God saw us in his mind's eye before we were even born. The pinnacle of his creation and then he commissioned the work. He molded us out of the dirt, breathed life into us, handcrafted us himself and desires to cherish us for all time. Which brings us to our key verse for tonight, if you have your place there. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. Paul's writing, and he writes this. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father from whom are all things, and for whom we exist and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. To which I like to paraphrase, we are a gift from God, for God, made by God. God treated himself with you. Did you hear that? God treated himself with you. You are a gift from God, for God, made by God. And even though some of us may hear that and we'd be like, oh yeah, Pastor Robert, I believe that. Hey, I don't fully understand that, but you know what, like, uh, you know, I, I think I agree with that. I've seen that in scripture. Or maybe you're here tonight and this is all new and you're just like, what is that guy saying? Wherever we're at tonight, how we view that statement, whether directly or indirectly, addresses a lot of the questions that people in life have. Christian or non-Christian. Questions like, am I desirable? Maybe you've never asked that question, but maybe you've felt that question. Am I desirable? Am I desirable to God? Even people who don't go to church still wonder that question at times or act in a way that proves to everyone that they have not found the answer to that question. Am I desirable? How about this question, who am I? The fundamental question of humanity, who am I? What is my identity? Who do I belong to? Or who should I live for? And when you think about these questions, it's good to try and wonder and ask, how much of the world around us, 
How much of our life, how much of the family waiting home for, waiting home for you, how much of the friends that you have that you'll go out with this weekend, how much of the classmates you'll see this week, how much of your life is affected by how we answer these questions? And do we truly believe and understand that we are from God, that we are for God, and we are made by God? What I want to do tonight is I want to invite you in to a place where I have been affected and still am being affected by this passage. So let's pick that apart and let's take a look at all three of those pieces of that statement. First off, I am a gift from God. I am a gift from God. If we are a gift from, then the good thing is to try and ask, who is the gift giver? Obviously God, but with that, who is God? And what is his intent in giving me to anyone? So first off, who is God? Matthew chapter 19, verse 17 says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Jesus says this. He said, why are you asking me what is good? So some inanimate object or person, are they displaying an attribute of goodness? No, no. There is only one who is good. And before we go any farther, we need to understand that God is good. It's not only in his nature, but all good originates from him. He is good. Psalm 100 verse 5 says this, For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Perhaps you've heard of this one. Psalm chapter 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is what? That the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So I have to petition to you that if the gift giver is good, what does that say about the type of gift he gives? James writes about this. James chapter 1, verse 17 says this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought who forth? He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of his first fruits of his creatures. Now, some of you have probably heard this before, that every good and perfect gift is from above. I, I meaning every blessing, everything that is good, inherently good, it, it comes from God. However, are you aware that it was accented by the context of it talking about you? That every good and perfect gift is from above. Of his own will, he brought us forth. Meaning, we are a good and perfect gift. Come on. Someone needs to try and hear that and understand that tonight. You are a good and perfect gift. To which you might be like, what are you talking about, Robert? Like, good, maybe sometimes. Perfect, definitely not. Well, let me define these terms. Good means what originates from God. That's what good means. Perfect means literally complete and mature. To which we would say, I would say, I don't know about you, but I'm not complete. And my wife would say, I'm definitely not mature. But it's not based on our perspective. It's based on God's perspective who sees the end from the beginning. And what he's trying to communicate to us tonight is saying, I have made you good and perfect. I have made you complete and mature because that's how I created you in the beginning. And I know how it's going to end. I'm going to redeem what you look like. And I know how it's going to end. And I say, you are good and you are perfect. Amen. Have you ever tried? You know, you got involved in a secret Santa. You pulled that name from the hat and you got that family member. <laughs> the person who is the hardest to pick a gift for. Anybody feel the pain? You like look at the name, you're like, no! It doesn't matter how hard you try, it's like you just always miss. And the body language gives it away. It's like, oh, thanks. Like, oh, yeah. Like, puts it behind them. Like, oh, it's such frustrating sometimes. Some people are really easy. But every now and then, 
even with a difficult person, a Christmas miracle happens. You're just walking along, maybe watching TV or whatever, and out of nowhere, this lightning bolt comes, and you're like, I got it. The perfect gift for them is, and it's just like something just dawns on you, and it clicks, and right away you know, I just found the most perfect gift for the most impossible person. What I sense God wants you to hear tonight is him whispering to your heart saying, you are the perfect gift for me. You are the perfect gift for me. You are the perfect gift for me. I got it. I know exactly what I want. And when I begin to think about that and allow that to wash over me, to really allow that to seep into my thinking, I can't help but understand and glean that I am desirable, that I'm wanted, that I have value and worth. And it's not based upon what I've done. It's based upon who he is and who I am known to be by God. You see, our divine worth says more about him than it does us. We are wanted by him. You know, I conducted an experiment. I went around the office in Building B and in this one, Building A, yesterday, and I uh, did a random questionnaire. I said, hey, 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 like, uh, only, only take two seconds. I just need your help for something. No right or wrong answer. I just want you to fill in the blank. Just shoot from the hip. Whatever you feel is like, just comes to mind, just, just give me your answer. And right away, like, people are backing up and, like, getting PTSD from, like, pop quizzes in college or whatever. I'm like, chill out. Like, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm like, here it goes. I want you to complete this sentence. God desires blank. God desires blank. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? And I asked him this question, and they gave me this list. Here, here, here's some of the results that I found. God desires, someone said, submission. I'm like, oh, yeah. I agree with that. That's good. Thank you very much. Went on my way. God desires faithfulness. Awesome. Great one. Thank you so much. I I believe that. Went away. God desires trust. Yes. Yes. God desires our heart. Awesome. Two people said God desires obedience. Totally believe that. Yes. Yes. We got to obey God. God desires intimacy. Ooh, that's a good one. Love that one. Love that one. God desires relationship. Three people said that one. God desires love, three people said that one. God desires to bless us. God desires mercy. And when I looked at this list, it confirmed what I had already started to assume, hoping that it would lead to, that almost all of these are actions I'm called to do or participate in, which are valid. I'm called to do these things. In fact, one of them is God's role to do. He desires to bless us. But all the rest of them, I'm called to do them and participate in. But my question to you is, what happens when I fail to do this? What happens when I fail to submit to God? Anybody ever not submit to God? Are you all perfect Christians? Anyone desire, anyone fail at being faithful to God? Not trust God? What happens when I fail to do this? You see, there was one action, there was one word given That wasn't an action. And here's the word. It's something that God has already decided on, not something I have to do. God desires me. God desires me. And God desires you and has always desired you. You see, I've I've shared this story before. My son Jude asked tons of questions. So inquisitive. And lately he's asking like <laughs> deep philosophical like meaning of life questions like this blowing me away. It's like, Dad, am I a good boy? Dad, are you, are you proud of me? It's just like, oh, just melt the heart, you know what I mean? But I could see him connecting it, starting to connect it to a pattern of behavior and performance. And don't get me wrong, I want my son to be a good listener. I want him to respect authority. I want him to listen to his teachers and his elders. However, I was starting to see him start to define that my being proud of him was based upon what he was doing. So I I, I noticed this. And so the next day, I picked him up from school, brought him over to my car, and before he got in, I said, hold hold on, Jude. 
kind of went down to his level, looked him in the eye, and said, Jude, I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm proud of you. And he's like, oh. he's like something he forgot, you know what I mean? Like, what did I, what did I do, Dad? What did I do? And I'm like, yeah, you didn't do anything. I'm proud of you because you're my son. And he sort of like, the wheels were turning, and he thought about it for a second. And then he like reached out and gave me a hug. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like it just make you want to cry in the moment. But this is what I feel God is wanting to communicate to us. That while there are things that he calls us to do, that is not the basis in him desiring us, in desiring me, in him being proud of you. He desires you because you are his child, because you are from him, and you are good, and you are perfect for him. And it would be great if we batted 100 at that, but I can tell you I fail sometimes at that. When I get this mixed up, when I base my worth on what I've done, not just the bad things, but especially the good things, that list that we had on the screen, then when I fail to do what God desires from me, you know what creeps in? I believe I'm undesirable by God. When I'm not faithful to him, I believe somewhere deep within I'm undesirable to God. I distance myself because I'm ashamed. Does anyone resonate with that feeling that sometimes comes? And sometimes uh, I'll take a truth that's within me and I'll start to question it. And I'll start to ask, what must God really think about me? If you've ever felt or ever been told that you're undesirable or that you're a mistake or that you've never intended to resemble anything good or that no one will ever know you or that you're not worth knowing, these are all lies from the pit of hell. They are not truth. The truth is that you are a gift from God. And sometimes when I'm going through it, I just need to wake up and the first thing that comes out of my mouth, honest to God, is whispering to myself, I am a gift from God. I am a gift from God. And God desires me. Before I ever do, I am from. We need to understand this. Then there's the second piece. I am a gift by God. I am a gift by God. Or I exist through him. In other words, hey, if I'm a gift from God, what should this gift look like? The fundamental question of life, who am I? If you've been if, uh, presented scripture for any length of time, you would have heard that, that we are made in God's image. Genesis 1.26 says this, then God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Psalm 139, 13 says this, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul, my soul knows it very well. Some of you may be aware of these scriptures. Maybe you've heard it you know, a few hundred times, even if you only come on Easter Sunday, maybe. But many of us sometimes think, I don't feel wonderfully made. I feel tragically broken talking about God's image, how in the world is this supposed to reflect God's image? And God understands that, and he comes with a plan. Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He writes this, And we all, with unveiled face, what that means is anyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ now has an unveiled face. It's a metaphor. Before having a life with Christ, we are spiritually dead, we are blind, so there's like this veil where we can't see anything. But once we place our faith in Jesus Christ, the veil is removed, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into what? Into the same image. What image? 
the image from the beginning, the image that you were intended to be, the good and perfect image that is after your Father, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Paul is saying that there is a plan to restore our image. Pastor Ken preached a beautiful message on the weekend from the Word of God talking about restoration. That our image is meant to be restored. It was never meant to be marred. It was never meant to have brokenness. We were meant to reflect our Father in nature and in purity and in quality, but sin came in. He's like, don't worry about it. I'm sending my son so that I can restore your image. I have a plan. And our restored image looks like Jesus. That's what it looks like. And I just sense God wants us to hear him whispering to our hearts, you are a part of me. You are a part of me. You come from me. I made you. You bear my image. And when I hear that, when I think about that, I can't help but feel accepted. No matter what's been going on, I am accepted. Why? Because God has included me in himself, in his image, in his nature, even in his community. Did you know that Jesus has his own small group? The triune nature of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father's like, I don't want my children to be away from me. Sent his sons to come rescue us. And through his resurrection power, anyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes and abides on the inside of us and whispers to our heart, come on, come chat with the three of us. We're going to tell you how to lead your family. We're going to tell you how to work. We're going to tell you how to talk to your neighbors. We're going to tell you how to think about yourself. Come into our community. The implications for this are massive. If everyone around us is made by God, then that means no one is ordinary. C.S. Lewis put it like this, there are, there are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. I love that. This speaks of dignity for all people. Why? Because every person is a gift by God. If we are a gift by God, you know what that tells me? That tells me then that my identity is not based upon who I say I am, but my identity is based upon who God says I am. It's not based upon what maybe a broken family has said I am or what culture says I am or what a, a, a hurtful relationship says I am. It's based upon who God says I am. And when I have messed up and I've mixed this up, when I don't accept who God says I am, I end up not accepting my true self. So what do I end up doing? I end up searching for ways to remake myself. I end up searching for ways to discover myself. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Ever go through a season where you try to discover yourself outside of God? And you go through what's called an identity crisis, trying to answer the question, who am I? You know, after high school, I was very involved in the hip hop scene. Not just, yeah, I got a laugh out there. If you know what I'm talking about, this was not just a category of music. This was a complete subculture, completely immersive. I was in a hip hop group, I rapped, I danced, I booked gigs, I ran clubs. We supported and perpetuated the culture of creativity through that lens. This wasn't just a hobby. This was something that I was a part of and I did it with all my heart and I grew in the gifts that God gave me because these gifts are irrevocable but I withdrew from God. Why? Because I was chasing my identity. I thought it was something out here to be discovered, outside of God. You see, there's nothing wrong with the gifts and talents, but they are a resource to invest and tools to serve the Lord with. They are not who I am. Even though I know how to break dance and maybe still rap, that's right, maybe later. <laughs> That's not who I am.
There is a higher superseding identity in who I am. And in that season and coming out of that season, the Lord blessed me with this verse. Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. And each of those terms have such expounded, vast definitions in that verse. So I created my own paraphrased version, if you will. Let me read it to you. Whoever searches for their distinct identity without Jesus will utterly destroy their soul. But if we utterly destroy our own version of who we think we are on account of who Jesus says we are, then finally we will discover who we really are. If we let go of our version of who we think we are, not founded on the Word of God, then finally, in Christ, we will discover who we really are. It's funny, when you listen in conversations, sometimes you can get a little window into who people think they are. You ever hear the question, tell me about yourself? Maybe in an interview, or maybe you're at a coffee shop, so tell me, maybe a speed date or whatever, like, I don't know. Tell me a little about yourself. It's interesting what people respond to that question. How we answer can be very revealing as to what we base our identity in. Why? Because people who answer that question, 90% of it is what they do. Tell me about yourself. And let us give you a long laundry list of what they do. Hobbies, work, passions. Could it be that it's giving a little expose as to maybe where you find your identity in? How about if you ask yourself this question? What or who do you allow to shape you? What do you allow to influence your thoughts about you? Is there a particular family member or a close friend? Maybe the college world and the world of academia has really began to mold what you think about yourself in a way that's incongruent to the Word of God. Is it culture? Is it what you're good at? What people applaud and give you accolades? Is it what you're known for? Is it the amount of likes that you get on social media affirming, hey, maybe this is me? Or is it even just foreign thoughts where you just have no idea where they're coming from? Maybe you're unaware that there's an enemy of your soul that wants to take you out and put up these strongholds in our thinking. I believe God wants us to know that if we have been made by the word of God, which we have, then the word of God, Jesus himself, is the only one who gets to speak as to who I am. No one else gets to say and when I feel the pressure to be something that I'm not, or the confusion that comes from trying to find myself, sometimes I just have to say to myself, I am a gift made by God. And I bear his image. I'm held together by his power. My identity comes from him alone. And in him, I am accepted. Let me move on to the last one. I am a gift for God. I am a gift for God. If I'm a gift from God, made by God, well then who is the gift receiver and how will they love the gift? If you look throughout scripture, you don't have to go far to see that I and we were meant for God alone. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, in Exodus 20 verse two, it says this, God says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. It's basically saying you shall have nothing else you give yourself to. There's no other name that should be on that gift tag. It should say from God to God. Don't write anyone else's name in there. You're only allowed to be given to me. If it goes on in verse 5, it says, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And it's not the type of jealousy we think of like some over-possessive boyfriend or girlfriend. It's not the human-tainted one. It's a righteous jealousy. We are his. God wants all of you. Even when the Pharisees were trying to test Jesus by asking him the greatest commandment, in Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus says this. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. He doesn't want 90% of you. 
He doesn't want 99% of you. He wants 100. And I just sense God wants us to hear him whispering to our hearts tonight. You are mine. You are mine. You are mine. And when I hear that and when I think about that, I can't help but feel that I am cherished. I'm cherished completely and eternally. That I could actually bring pleasure to God. That I'm both fully known and fully loved and it's never ending. I'm not some fling that he's going to be involved with and dump a month later. He's eternally invested in cherishing me for the rest of time. And when I mix this up, when I lose sight of this, when I don't allow myself to be fully known, when I give God restricted access to my life, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah God, you could have all this, but yeah, don't go to that back room right there. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 God, I'll go to church and be involved, in, but you, know, you can't tell me how to run my business. You can't tell me what to do with my finances. You can't tell me the boundaries of sexual relationships. No, 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 that's restricted access. When we don't give them allow him to be fully known or fully loved or guarded. It's one thing to believe God loves you. It's another thing to allow God to love you, for his love to come in and wreck you, to heal that heart, to be completely abandoned, to surrender, and to be completely torn apart, to be reassembled and whole. When I lose sight of this, I end up giving pieces of myself to other things and to other people. Scripture talk about this and call it idolatry. And it's such a complex and deep topic. I'll simplify it by this. The definition of idolatry for me is when I make a good thing an ultimate thing. Because we all know that we're supposed to stay away from bad things. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I don't need to be, like, you know, giving myself to that. But the things that sometimes go undetected are good things. It's when we make a good thing our marriage our children, our careers, our success. It's when we make a good thing an ultimate thing above God. And I end up hoping to be cherished by those things only to be disappointed and needing distractions and distracting pleasures to mask that disappointment. And what do we end up with? We end up with a community and a culture that lives for the weekend that lives for that vacation, that lives for that promotion, that lives for those words from that person. Why? Because we are desiring to be cherished. We're chasing the question, what is the good life? What do I need to give myself to? We need to ask the question, what do I give myself to? What good thing have I made an ultimate thing? You see, I have to ask this regularly. Because when I sense the temptation to give myself over to something that doesn't fully know me, or I observe a habit that I do to mask over the emptiness of not being cherished, I imagine God whispering to my heart, you are mine, and I do not share. You are mine, and I do not share. Share. You are a gift for God. And you are cherished by him. But I think the ultimate tension comes from looking at a gift like this. And quite honestly, there might be someone here that's like, hey, Robert, I hear you. I even agree with everything that you're saying. But I, I look at this gift and I'm just like, that, I can't even begin to identify that I'm a gift from God, for, for God and by God. Quite honestly, if I were to try and think of myself, I think I look more like this. <laughs> kind of remnants from what it was supposed to be. I, I, I can't help but like thinking like, having thoughts that I'm undesirable. What am I even here for? No rhyme or reason to purpose, chasing from season to season who I'm meant to be or what's in this life 
What am I supposed to live for? Who am I supposed to give my life to? And how in the world is this supposed to become that? I'm here to let you know that the God who created you already knew that this was going to happen. And he made a plan in his son. In fact, probably one of the most famous scriptures of all time, even the greatest of sinners could quote it to you. For God so loved you that he gave the greatest gift of all time. That God so loved you, the world, that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, that anyone in him would have the hope. You see, God, Jesus didn't just come from God. Jesus wasn't made by God. He is God. And he was given to us. Jesus, on the tag, it says, from God to Robert. And Jesus came to earth and did what we couldn't do. He kept his wrapping clean. He was pure. He never sinned. Tempted in every way like you and I. Any pain that you're going through right now, mentally, physically, he's aware of it. He's gone through it. Scriptures say he's able to identify with what, and yet he stayed pure. Why? Because he was going to make the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. Harrison's favorite scripture, that he who was without sin became Sin. Jesus like, don't worry about it. I'm keeping myself pure because you know why? I'm going to become this for you. I'm going to become this for you so that for all time I can nail this to the cross. And in my body, I can bury it in the ground. And when my Father resurrects me, this is what's going to rise up. So that the Spirit of the living God can come and live on the inside of you. And the greatest victory in the gospel message is, yes, you can be like this, but in Christ when God looks at you, the only thing he sees is his son. You are good and you are perfect. You are from him. You are made by him. And you are given to him. Whenever you have the temptation to look at yourself in the way that the enemy would love to, this is what the Father wants you to see. You are in Christ redeeming your image and one day when we stand before God in all of his glory you will look like that for all time but until the day comes you get to share the glorious good news to every single marred and banged up package around you that God in flesh came to earth so that we could look like him to restore our image don't let the devil rob you of your image beat you up make you wake Horrible decisions to shore up your insecurity. The word of God is coming to you, my friend, to inform you that you are his and he does not want to share you. Why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes? Because I feel I want to give an opportunity to those who perhaps have never had the chance to place themselves inside of Christ. And quite simply, that just means you put your hope in him. You don't have the evidence yet, but you just sense that this is what the decision you need to make. Scripture calls it faith. You sense the evidence right now, the substance of hope, and you're like, I want to be able to live with him. God sent his son for this purpose so that the original plan for all of God's children could be with him. And it it's not something so crazy difficult or religious hoops you have to pass through all your life and wonder if you're saved. It's not difficult because Christ did the difficult thing for you, the impossible thing. No one can come to God without Jesus because no one could be hidden in anything except for Christ. And if you're here and if you want to pray with me, a prayer, a sincere prayer to God will ensure that you are in him and it will begin the journey of you being renewed to look like him. If you're here and you never prayed that prayer, or maybe you're like me and you've walked away at some point, prodigal son, prodigal daughter, tonight is the night to come back. Don't waste any time. Don't believe the lies. God loves you. He cherishes you more than anyone or anything who ever will. I'd be honored to pray with you. But in order to see who I'm praying with, with everyone, eyes closed, I would just like to acknowledge you and ask you to raise your hand on the count of three. Ready, one, 
two, three. If you want to get on this prayer, just go ahead and raise your hand to give your life to Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Every section. Raise it up just for a moment longer. Thank you, Jesus. I see all of your hands. More importantly, God sees them. Go ahead and put them down. I'm going to give you some words to repeat. Uh, make them personally your own. You're talking to God yourself. The congregation will join in with us and just in support. And let's pray for Lee sincerely speak to God. Repeat after me. Say, Father, thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross in my place. Thank you for washing my sin white as snow. And right now, I confess you as Lord, boss of my life. Show me how to live Show me how to think. Help me to understand that I am yours and you are mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, why don't we give him a hand?